we'd encounter a period where central banks would have to print into high inflation, right? So normally when inflation's low, central banks have more flexibility to, you know, print money. And when inflation is very high, that's when they try to pull back and tighten and try to rein that in. One of the theses that I've had is that this period looks a lot like the 1940s, which is when you have a combination of high debt and high inflation, uh, which is not what you had in the 70s. In the 70s, they had low debt and high inflation, which means they had a lot more tools to respond to it with, with higher rates uh, and with, with tighter monetary conditions. Whereas when you have that combination of both, it's very hard uh, for central banks to do it. That's the closest thing that a central bank has to a checkmate scenario where there's there's only bad options uh, and they can they can pick between some bad options, they can delay things, uh, but they basically run into an inability to control uh, you know, the system as they'd like to. And, you know, going into this, th this higher inflation, uh, energy crisis type of period, there are some central banks uh, that were, you know, they, they did all the things you'd expect. Uh, like Brazil, for example, they raised rates from like 2% to like 14% starting early in 2021. Uh, a lot of emerging markets really have no uh, uh, choice. They, they pretty much have to front run that because they face more severe currency problems if they don't. Whereas on the other side of the spectrum, some of the most indebted developed countries in the world, uh, you know, from the beginning, from the beginning of the race, they basically tripped over themselves, right? So the Bank of Japan, as all this inflation was coming in, they just said, we're not even going to try. We're gonna we're gonna keep keep rates at zero. We're even gonna do yield curve control. So even if the longer end of the bond curve tries to go up, we're gonna keep printing money and buying those bonds to hold the yields down, uh, even if inflation's above our target, right? So so Bank of Japan's on one side, and then you have central banks like Bra like Brazil on the other side, and. The ECB was also kind of in that Bank of Japan camp, where they have Italy with 150% debt to GDP. Uh, you know, the foreign sector doesn't really want their bonds, uh, and so the ECB is doing this this scheme to sell some German bonds and buy some Italian bonds, and other countries are involved as well. So they're they're kind of in a slightly more limited version of what Japan is doing. And my thesis from a few months ago is that we're going to probably see this in more central banks. I, I cited that the Fed was still holding on, the Bank of England was still holding on, meaning that they were able to tighten to some degree, uh, but that over time they would start falling like dominoes and have to print into high inflation like like Japan and, and to some extent like the ECB is doing. And unfortunately, what we saw in the past couple of weeks is that the Bank of England you know, that domino did fall. They had to join the chorus of some of the other most indebted countries and if you hold all the way to maturity, it doesn't matter too much. I mean, inflation above yields still matters. Uh, but if you're posting them as collateral and you need to maintain certain ratios, uh, if that if that value of the collateral goes down, you know, you might get liquidated. You might have to sell those bonds and 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 basically, you know, settle that that leverage. And then the problem is if if everybody's using the same collateral and is involved in the same type of scheme, then once one party has to sell. That further worsens the price because now you have, now you're a forced seller. That's why, for example, in the Bitcoin market, some of those some of those price drops can be dramatic because you get a lot of people that have to sell at the same time, and you kind of had a slightly less extreme version of the bond market, but it's more severe when it happens to the bond market because this is supposed to be, uh, you know, one of the safer types of investments, and so you had forced selling, which made the price worse, and therefore more funds had to do for selling, which makes the price worse. And it just it, it, it creates a vicious cycle that feeds on itself. And there's no other balance sheet that's kind of ready to jump in and absorb all this. And so if it was left unchecked, you could have had yields just keep spiking. Uh, and and you, then you, you can get outright kind of mass liquidations and a literal default. Uh, and so that's where Bank of England steps in and says, look, we they literally had a, a, a speech planned the next day for how they were going to reduce their balance sheet. They had to scrap that and they had to go from planning to reduce their balance sheet to increase their balance sheet, you know, doing QE, uh, buying bonds. And they plan on doing it for two weeks. Uh, and then, you know, they, they delay their intended bond sales. They eventually want to get back to trying to sell bonds. We'll see if they ever, ever get there. Usually the answer with these types of things is no. Usually the, usually the balance sheet keeps going up. It might pause for a period of time. It might go down, you know, briefly, but it's hard for them to ever you know, get those down because there's really a, a lack of balance sheet capacity to absorb the size of the flows. And in recent days, you know, the base of the Bank of England stepping in helped solve the yield problem. So it stopped that that kind of vicious cycle of forced selling. Uh, we also saw that the government kind of walked back some of their fiscal plans to try to restore some degree of confidence in the market. And so the, the emergency is kind of 
you know, on, on ice for now. Uh, but we, we, have, we still have a situation where the Bank of England is doing QE uh, during 10% inflation, which is, you know, that's kind of banana, banana republic type of, you know, stuff. Uh, but that's that's what we get in a high a toxic combination of high debt. You know, I, I don't hyperinflation's not been a, a key part of my expectation, at least in any sort of investable time horizon. Right. So when you look out long enough, you know, all fiat currencies have historically failed. Um, but in any sort of like three to five year time horizon, I've not had hyperinflation uh, as, as you know, any of my calls on, on developed market currencies. This contributes to high inflation uh, because basically you have a loosening of financial conditions into inflation that's already hot. Now, the, the bigger factor is going to be what the budget deficit is. Um, you know, that, that, that's, what, that's what's actually, you know, adding to money supply along with bank lending. Uh, but, you know, if, if the interest rates are, are not suitable compared to uh, inflation. It means the foreign sector doesn't really want to hold that currency. Uh, and then two, if the bank's doing QE to hold yields low, that's again, that's contributing to you know the, the foreign market not want to buy that currency. We saw that in Japan, for example. Now, they have a much less severe energy crisis. Uh, and so they have lower inflation, that's still, but it's still above their target. Uh, and so when, when the bond market can't set prices the way it thinks it should, they instead just get out of the bonds and that hurt the currency, right? So, so the release valve ends up being the currency. Uh, and you know, that, that can happen in various degrees right now. Uh, both, both the, the British, uh, bonds and the currency have, have stabilized to some extent, just because there's, there's more restored confidence that, you know, this system's kind of, you know, th this problem's contained for the moment, be a longer term, it, it creates selling pressure on the currency. And why you have hyperinflation in some, uh, developing countries is that they have liabilities that they can't print, right? So in emerging markets case, it's often, they have dollar based debts, uh, which means that, you know, no amount of printing can can just fix their liabilities. Uh, they can't, in other words, they can't dilute their liabilities with inflation, uh, and so they they actually face risk of default, which can which can destroy the value of the currency. Uh, and then if you look at Weimar, they had war reparations. They owed you know reparations in gold. They you know their their industrial base was damaged by the war, so they had serious supply uh, uh, you know constraints. And we're seeing a, a mini version of that in Europe today, unfortunately, where. You know, there's an acute energy shortage. It's kind of like an emerging market that has liabilities that it can't just print. Uh, and so that's why we're seeing unusually high inflation in Europe, even compared to some other trouble spots like Japan or, or the United States and, and, and other countries like that, because it's, it's that, that specific energy shortage that is worse there for, for you know, reasons we all know. So Japan is in a, a weird case because it, it's it's managed to prolong its situation more than any other country in, in its circumstances has done. And when people think of Japan, they often think of crazy money printing, right? They, they think of, you know, the country has 250 percent debt to GDP. The Bank of Japan's balance sheet is bigger than 100 percent of GDP. It looks like a, a chart that just keeps going straight up. 